City University Television presents The American Theatre Wing Seminars Working in the Theatre This seminar, Actors on Performing I'm Sandra Gilman, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. Welcome to our Working in the Theatre Seminars. Today we are going to talk about actors and performance. We'll be back to show you a little more about the work of the American Theatre Wing, but right now let us join our panel and our moderator, Pia Lindstrom. We indeed have a fabulous group of actors here today. They are extraordinary, a wealth of information and talent right here, and they're going to tell us how they do it, where they do it, <laughs> how often they do it, <laughs> and why they do it. They're a wonderful group. I am so really, truly pleased to be here today. First of all, let me go around the panel and introduce Brian F. O'Byrne, the incredible actor who won a Tony for Frozen. He's now in Doubt, a parable. He plays Father Flynn. He had Tony nomination for Lonesome West, and he was in that very weird play, The Beauty Queen of Lenan. And the wonderful Victoria Clark, who won a Tony Award for Light in the Piazza, a role that just resonates with maternal regret and hope. It was just grand. And next to her, George Grizzard, who has been around for quite a while, the original Nick in uh, Edward Albee's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Now he's in Seascape, playing with lizards. We'll get back to that <laughs> shortly. And he's had a great deal of experience we want to hear about. And on my other side is Michael Severus in Sweeney Todd, an absolutely terrifying performance. Severus. Severus. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Severus. It trips up everybody. Where, what is the origin well, of it was, Severus? It was Cheverizzo originally when my grandfather came over as Italian. Oh, and when he was decommissioned from the army, from the American army, you could just change your name without without having to go through a whole rigmarole, and somebody convinced him that dropping the vowel at the end of his name would make it easier to get work in America. <laughs> so, so they took the ZZO off and put an S on, and it became Cerverus, which Cerverus. people assume is Greek anyway, oh. so it oh. sort of did nobody any favors, really. Oh. Well, you are a marvelous actor in Sweeney Todd. Uh, you won a Tony Award for Assassins. He's been in Passion, Sunday in the Park with George, mm -hmm. kind of a Sondheim interpreter now. <laughs> Lately. And Jill Clayburgh, who we all know for more than 25 starring roles in films, doing so many things, recently in Naked Girl on the Appian Way, and right now starting with in Barefoot in the Park, one right after another. Yep. Welcome all. I think we should start right at the beginning. When did you first go to the theater? Mm. How did you get into the theater, Brian? Uh, well, I don't come from any theatre background or anything like that, but I come from a, a very small uh, village in Ireland. And um, I mean, I only, uh, how kind of quiet it was at the time was there was no movie theatres. Uh, I only saw two movies in the theatre before I was 18. Mm -hmm. I saw maybe, I saw one play before I was 18. Um, but there was, because it was such a small little community, um, there was uh, community theatre and stuff like that in the, in the local village hall. So I guess I grew up around watching local, local people put on little skits and stuff to kind of while away those endless winter nights. Um, so I, I, I guess that was where I saw theatre, but I mean I had no intention of ever becoming an actor. I mean that, that was a whole other just something that happened, a very uh, haphazard thing that happened in my early 20s, but I had no, I, no desire. I mean, it was so beyond me to, to even imagine that <laughs> someone would become an actor. I, 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 I find it extraordinary when I hear people now that say, well, I always wanted to be an actor. I, I, well, for, I think two things. One, did you not have better dreams? <laughs> <laughs> like, why? Uh, what did you not want? Would you not want to kind of do something good for humanity? <laughs> but, uh, so uh, I never wanted to be an actor or anything like that, but perhaps my... Uh, uh, you know, then I, I, the only things I saw were local people putting on little skits and people sitting in the town hall pointing, going, there's, you know, whoever doing this, aren't they funny? That Did was somebody it. here see a play and then say, I want to do that immediately? 
No. What was I, the first play you saw? Well, the, f the first play I saw probably was the first play I was in. My, my father <laughs> taught, at, taught at universities, um, so when they needed a kid for the college show, I ended up being, you know, drafted into service. So my, the first play I was in was Caucasian Chalk Circle. So oh, I was like oh. in at the deep end with yes. Rex. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I was, I was all of like, I don't know, six or something. My, uh, I was one of the little prince's friends. And, mm -hmm. uh, and at some point the kid playing the little prince went on, I don't know, got another job or something. And um, so they asked me if I wanted to take over. And I said no, because it meant I would have to learn lines and like be responsible. And, and, and I was having fun just sort of running around backstage. And it's probably the last time I ever turned down a bigger part. <laughs> But I did kind of, I had sort of the opposite experience to Brian, where I grew up in an artistic family and my father's a musician and my mother's a modern dancer. They met at Juilliard and oh, wow. so I was kind of, then they sent me to good schools hoping that something else would take and, <laughs> and I resisted it really through, through college. I mean, I went to college, I specifically chose a liberal arts school instead of a conservatory because I didn't want to only know, you know, performance. And, um, and I and I kept looking for something else that I could do, something else that I would be better at or enjoy more. And and I just never I never found it. And even when I started sort of thinking I would try it as a profession, I just sort of thought, well, this isn't really going to work. But I'll get it out of my system, and then I can happily go on to, you know, the next thing. And I just you know I, every. Every few months, I keep thinking, I may have found that moment now. <laughs> <laughs> Did somebody take you to the theater, Jill? Well, I grew up in, in New York, and my mother was, uh, she worked for David Merrick and for a couple of Broadway producers, and so she was passionate about the theater, even though she wasn't an actress. She had been in a summer stock company with Henry Fonda and Margaret Sullivan and sort of gave them her clothes and took care of the books. And but she was always outside and loved it. It was really her, I would say, the biggest passion in her life. And so I did start going to the theater. I mean, I saw Peter Pan. I saw uh, things that I can't even remember the names of when I was really young and then I saw a lot of theater growing up but that didn't mean it had anything to do with me mm -hmm. it's just what my mother really lit up about mm -hmm. and um, and I was really tall and I would play some boys parts in school because I went to a girls school in New York and that got old so then I sort of stopped the acting and um, went to college and I, I really had no idea. I didn't have a, a thing about what I was going to do. And, and women really didn't necessarily have career ambitions. Some did, many didn't. And, but then I thought, my God, w w these women are just getting married and doing nothing. And that really, as an idea, drove me crazy. So then I went to college and I studied philosophy and religion and stuff like that interested me, except that I had a roommate who um, was an actress and she took me to Williamstown uh, and, and I was an apprentice and I just fell in love with it. Then I just, and then I thought, oh my God, there's something that makes life worth living. <laughs> <laughs> Did you it have was that just feeling? a falling in love thing. <laughs> Did you have that feeling that... I think, uh, like Jill, my family dynamic was very influential um, in sort of pushing me in this direction because my mother was also very passionate about the theater and opera in particular. And the, I grew up in Dallas and the Met, the Met would come and tour through Dallas every late spring and summer. And so I saw all the great artists there. Teresa Stratus and Bartered Bride. I mean, there are some things that have always stuck with me. She did one of her arias hanging upside down on a swing. <laughs> and, and just effortless, the voice just flowing out of her. And Beverly Sills and Joan Sutherland and Marilyn Horn, uh, all the great artists. And, and I was sort of annoyed that I didn't understand what they were singing about, but I was captivated <laughs> by the sound. So for me, it was always about the way things sounded. Um, and I remember my mom uh, bought me a three-record set of King and I, 
uh, Carousel and Oklahoma. Ugh. And I played it over and over on my little plastic uh, <laughs> record player when I was six. I played it over and over and over again. And um, just because my fam family dynamic, I had two older brothers who were kind of cut-ups. We're all sort of crazy in cut-ups. And um, it was always my job to entertain. And my dad was a real, you know, he was always a good target to try to get him to laugh at the dinner table and play jokes on my mother. And so there was always, you know, very happy memories of of entertaining one another, and it was always my job, really, to sort of be the ringleader of that. And I think it was just a role I fell into naturally because I enjoyed, you know, cracking everyone up. But um, it um, it became more serious for me when um, I was sort of other, was really not good at other things like dancing. I would always, mother would put the tutu on me, and I would sort of always be called upon to do the dance of the sugar plum fairy, you know, sort of an egregious. <laughs> event. And, um, <laughs> and then <laughs> that was sort of a disaster. And the piano recitals were all a disaster. So I think sort of I, cho I chose voice as a way to express myself. And it became serious when I was around 15 or 16, when people started, you know, uh, really saying this might be something special. And it was just, it was the only thing that brought me joy. And on the deepest it level. It brings us joy too. Oh, joy. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just it uh -huh. makes me, it's the only thing I've found in my life that um, expresses everything that I want to say and in the way that I want to say it, the speaking and the singing voice. So I think I've always been sort of obsessed with the way things sound. And uh -huh. I had teachers who kind of encouraged me when I was 16 to go to Interlochen. Um, and uh, there's, they have a really fantastic uh, summer program there. And I sort of got involved in musicals there. And then when I was in college, I stopped all performing and just directed. and thought about going to med school and mm. for me like the idea of healing and medicine and the arts are very interwoven I mean I really feel that a lot of what we're called to do is is an actual calling it's more about um, you know God using me to to express something that will hopefully heal George, George <laughs> that you? sounds corny but no it doesn't sound corny at all it sounds very wise did you feel you had a calling I was in the third grade pageant as a pilgrim. <laughs> yeah, you see? And spiritual that, basis that there. Start, that started it <laughs> all. That's yeah. spiritual. That's right. yeah. But I had the same feeling with the church and the theater. Oh. Mm. Because I felt that the calling, you know, I used to say, I can do as much on the stage every night as you can do on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, you know, is there a God in the play? If there isn't, I don't want to be in it. I, it doesn't mm -hmm. interest me, you know. Uh, Did you think about the ministry? Not at all. No, I, I w studied advertising. <laughs> <laughs> How so God likes actually kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. well, I, well, and did, then when I, did you first go to the theater? Did somebody take you? Or? I went to see. <laughs> on my 16th birthday, my parents said, what do you want? I said, there's a, a musical coming to the uh, National Theater in Washington, where I grew up, and I want to see that. So it was Dark of the Moon, and they got tickets to The Merry Widow, because <laughs> that was the musical they knew. <laughs> and uh, I, I told Helen Hayes, who was a great lady of the theater, that story because she grew up in Washington. She said, you know, that was the first professional production I ever saw. Hmm. I don't think it was the same production. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I don't know, then I just had a good time. And I went to college and uh, I decided, the only A I got in college was in the one course I took in the drama department. So I thought that should have told me something. Well then let's go to uh, how you got to the theater you're presently in. Um, for instance, Brian, did you have to audition to get in? Did somebody see you already in Frozen? For Doubt, yeah. Doubt? Well, you know, or how Doug did you get... directed Frozen as well. So he... Well, kind of. It was a kind of roundabout thing. Uh, I don't know why. Another theater did a reading of, of uh, Doubt, mm -hmm. like last year, with a different cast. Heather and myself were asked along to go to this, this reading with... Uh, and Shanley was going to direct it. It was a reading of this new play, Doubt. So I did the reading. I, I read the play and I didn't think it was very good. And then I went and I met Shanley and Shanley was kind of, you know, interesting. I said, but I wanted to meet Shanley and just, you know, those readings we all do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, there was a wonderful woman in Cherry, playing Cherry's part. And we, and we sat and, we, and we, we went through the day and we did the reading in the afternoon. 
And then that was it. And then I was do doing Frozen at the time, and Doug Hughes came up to me uh, and said, I've been given this play, Doubt, now by a different theatre, by Manhattan Theatre Club at this stage. Uh, what do you think of it? And I went, you know, I've got to be honest with you, it's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> said, really? I think it's good. And I went, you know, it was a bit better when we did the reading, but it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I ended up. And then he came back and he said, well, do, you know, do you want to do it? And I'm like, well, okay, maybe, maybe, you know, it's a, it's a fun part. Yeah. Like sometimes, I don't know if you guys are the same, that even mm. if you don't feel the play is right, thankfully, I, I, now I know, because I've had similar instances in the past, uh, showing that I don't like the play, and it turned out to be a big fat hit and very good, but I'm intrigued by the character. I don't know if you get that. I was intrigued yeah. by the character. And uh, I went, well, it's only three, it's only 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't think it's going to run. <laughs> you know, it's only 12 <laughs> weeks. You get to work with, you get to do, you know, the whole American thing. And then you get to mm -hmm. work with Shami and work with Doug again and, and all of that. So, um, but I thought I was going to do a film. And I went, no, I can't do it. And he said, well, we'll come back to you. Thank God when I think about it. I, I mean, I did everything oh, but yes. say, no, I don't want to do <laughs> oh, this. Yes, is that <laughs> lucky. <laughs> he came back and <coughs> obviously they must have, mm -hmm. I don't know, I think they probably did offer it to somebody much better than me and no. they, they turned it down. They, they and, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it kind of, I was available. So, mm -hmm. the, uh, Jill, how did you get mm -hmm. uh, the part, say, in, in Appian Way? It's so, well... It's Doug, yeah, Doug. Because I had worked with Doug oh, before. Oh, so it's the connection it's of the very same... Very similar thing. I had done... Um, an Arthur Miller play with him, and uh, then he just called me, you know, and said, would you, would you like to do this? And I, I really so wanted to work with him again. Um, and I loved the part, and I thought the play was interesting. And so th th it, it happened, you know, I mean, I, I was, <laughs> I went along with it a little more than you did. <laughs> well, <laughs> you liked it a little better. <laughs> Yeah, um, but we had had a good time with all my sons, and um, you know. But I think that's interesting what you're saying. It's I find it really hard to read a play and understand on the page what it really is go is going to be. I find that so difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I find that the first day in rehearsals is when you know if something is really there. When people when people stand are reading up it, and you just go boom, and you yeah. go. Yeah. Well, I went through the reading process. Oh, that's true. That didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it is when people just stand up and you go, oh, okay. Somebody does something mm -hmm. physically to go, oh, they've mm -hmm. just right. added something. Mm -hmm. right. You know, and the reading is still difficult mm -hmm. for me. I don't get to see it. But physically, if somebody can just all of a sudden just turn around and you go, oh, this is going to be good. Mm -hmm. But have you ever had the other thing where you read a play and you love the play, but you just think, I can't see me in it. I wish I could. I, I would love to be... Did you the see guy. yourself as Sweeney Todd? Um, no, well, it's, it's Sweeney Todd was the first Broadway show I ever saw. My father took me to it, and um, oh, that's amazing. And, what a charming and, first play. Yeah. <laughs> 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 seven, seven years old. old. A lot about my dad, old. I guess. <laughs> 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 but it it kind of set the bar impossibly high too. Um, he was a big Sondheim fan, and oh, um, he had actually music directed, uh, night music, and a few other things at, at the university where he was teaching in West Virginia. And, um, so I think it was a preview, actually. It was before it had even opened. And, and it was just, and that huge, amazing spectacle of a production was just so overwhelming. And, you know, Len Carew was, was, you know, hung the moon as far as I was concerned. And, mm -hmm. and I saw it seven times oh, over the no. next year oh or two. You know, I was, I was Did you ever sing. imagine you'd be in it? No. I mean, because, how could well, because how could you? How could how you could ever you? imagine that little you <laughs> could be in oh. that, in that iconic thing? Well, you thing. must have known all the words and all the music. You saw it seven times <laughs> when you went to the rehearsal. I didn't know the all parts, but... <laughs> Um, oh, I, d I, well, I was very familiar with it, although when I went to start working on it, or actually before I met with John Doyle for the first time, I read the, the script again mm -hmm. and was amazed at things that I hadn't realized mm -hmm. before or in, what it actually is about as opposed to what I sort of remembered it mm -hmm. being right. about. And, and the joy of this production for me is that it is so radically re 
reinvestigated. It's not, it's not changed or reinterpreted, but it's just really going back to the elements of it and rediscovering it all. And that kind of took the onus off of, of me having to live up to my memories of it and my memories of Len Cario and then George Hearn, who I yeah. saw also. Mm -hmm. um, Otherwise, I don't see how I could have done it because it just would have been too much of a burden, my own memory and other people's expectations and, and all of that. So I was so thankful that, that I could be in, do it in this production. And uh, people ask you all the time, you know, what part have you never played that you want to play or, you know, what is your dream role? And I never have good answers for those questions. But if I had had one, it probably would have been Sweeney. Hmm. But I never thought I was going to be in musicals anyway, so uh, that was another reason I wouldn't have thought that I would ever end up doing this. Well, come again when you have Judge on the menu. Wait till we don't have Judge yet. Would you suffer for the next best thing? What's that? Executioner. Have charity toward the world, my pet. Yes, yes, I know, my love. Well, take the customers that we can get. My born and low. We'll not discriminate great from small No, we'll serve anyone Meaning anyone And to anyone at all How did you get into Seascape? <laughs> Lassoed and brought it uh, well, I had done it about four years ago in, oh, okay. at the Hartford stage with, with Mark Lamos, okay. and, and that's how I guess. You see, <clears throat> you have to have this backup group of writers mm. and directors that you work with. Mm -hmm. now, this is the third play of Edward Albee's I've done on Broadway, and I've done four of Pete Gurney's plays because they write about wasps, and that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> and so if it weren't for them, I would have been retired several years ago. <laughs> but I, uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, so much of it has to do with luck and timing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got the first Broadway play I read for, which was just timing and luck. Mm. And it was astounding. Uh, you know, I had come from the arena stage in Washington, and the first time, I, and I got there, all of a sudden, I was playing Paul Newman's little brother for a year in a play, you know? And that was one of the great things, because he's a great man, and I, and I just, did, we became good friends, and I admire him so much in the way he's treated his, his career, and the way he has shared himself and his celebrity and his money for good causes, and ah, he's a terrific fellow. And that was a treat, you know? And a, that was luck. And so much of it is, I think. Mm. Was it Luck, Virginia? Victoria. Victoria? That's okay. I'm not doing well right. on names today. <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll answer to anything. Um, well, Vicky. That, yeah, Vicky is fine. Um, I, I, was, I was lucky. I, I heard the last uh, song in our show, which is called Fable. I, um, a, friend of, a friend of mine uh, that Michael and I went to college with, Ted Sperling, is our music director. You guys went to college together? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah. We Where did you go to college? Went to yeah. Yale. Undergrad. Mm -hmm. Oh, you did. Yeah. 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 He was doing important theater, and I was. <laughs> I was well, that's what I kept I telling I was doing right the musicals now. in the dining halls. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, um, yes, uh, Ted came to my house, and he said, M uh, "Adam Gettle is writing a, a, a new musical, and uh, I want to play the last song in the show." Actually, it wasn't even the last song. I just want to play something from the show. He sat down on my piano and played it, and it was one of those weird moments where I didn't, hadn't seen anything in the script, I hadn't heard another note of the score, and I just, I, I called up Adam, I said, I have to play that part. I know, I know who she is, I, and it was with Ted singing too, I mean, but I heard the lyric and I heard the song and I heard the music and I said, I know who she is, and, and I called him up and he left a message back saying, you're way too young to play it, we need, you don't oh, look that's... old enough to play someone who's a mother of a 26 year old, and I said, well, that's why God invented wigs. <laughs> <laughs> Please, please give me an audition. So I begged for an audition, and they were very unsure about it. And uh, most of, mostly what Craig Lucas and Bart had seen me do was very comedic, and they were very worried about. I had to really audition three or four times for it. Mm. And then actually Craig called me up at 8.30 on Thanksgiving morning uh, 
three years ago, and, said, and I thought it was a prank call. I thought it was one of my friends. You know? <laughs> like, hi, Vicky, it's Craig Lucas. And I'm like, come on, who is this? I want to wish you luck on your callback. I'm like, who is calling me? It's certainly not Craig Lucas. And of course it was. And he was just giving me support and saying, you know, we really need to see you drop way down for the callback. We really need to see you. Take what does that mean? What is drop way down? I think he meant... Don't be afraid to really uh, land, you know, some of the more serious moments in, this, in, in the scene that they had given me. Is this vocal? Is this singing no, one? This Sorry, is, this is acting. This is an oh, acting. acting. So, okay. it, was a, it was a scene. They were, I think they were okay with the singing, and they just needed to really see something. And, uh, and I guess they saw what they needed to see, and it was, um, it was, it was, I mean, there have been a lot of parallels between that character and me and, uh, and the Southern it, roots and everything. Say it's a part of a lifetime. You no, seem mm. so suited to it that role. It truly is. But it's one of those things, like sometimes you go down to BAM and you see something, one, a fantastic theater company, you go, oh, my God, you know, what is going on there? And it's, it's simply nothing more than they've had in nine months or a year or two years working on this project. And we're so often in our culture in this country, we're so rushed to get to the product phase. And we were very blessed. We had two full out-of-town productions, one at mm. the Intamon in Seattle, one at the Goodman in Chicago. I mean, the first time I picked up the script was over three years ago. So when you have that kind of time and time in between productions for the character to live in you, yeah. you know, it's much more relaxing and it's much more, it's a thorough way to work. And I wish that we had that opportunity more often because mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, to read something, even if you know it's coming in a couple of months, to try in four weeks or six weeks rehearsal and four weeks of previews to come up with something that feels inside you, I, I, it's very challenging. I, my hat's off to anybody that feels comfortable with that because I always feel like I, I never have enough time. You can walk in the ruins for a wishing well, for a magic apple, for a chariot that will carry you to a moon on a hill, to a hidden stream, a lagoon and a rock, a wise on dream, silhouette set away from time forever, to a valley beyond the setting sun, where water shine and horses run, where there's a man who loves with you, loves a fake. more time to develop the character, come I up do. with the characterization. Or, or, just, or at least not feel the pressure of getting to anything. You know, the, the best kind of rehearsal day is when you feel like you're just there to just work today and there's no sense of impending opening or, or critics or any of the things that become part of the commercial reality of, of your work. Just when, when you have that sense that you sort of had in school when you were just going to try to figure something out today in the <coughs> sandbox. Just play. Exactly. Just I never know when the opening night is. People say, when do you open? I don't know. It's some next, next, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know when the closing night is. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, never, I never seem to know when the opening night is. But you don't have opening nights anymore. When I started out, they all came on one night. Right. Mm -hmm. I still do that in Britain and Ireland. Yeah. That's oh, I nice. Because hate, hate you can that. always do it one Could night. You? But when you have to do it six performances yeah. or eight, you know, every time, and then you get different opinions mm -hmm. because they didn't see the same performance. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting. Or, or yeah. they just didn't like you, mm -hmm. let's face it. So. <laughs> see, I couldn't stand the one night. It really Too drove me out of... Doing oh, really? plays, oh, I love it that. was too because that that just that one night just I was nervous enough, and that one night just too much pressure killed my mind. I just couldn't. I really couldn't perform on that night. Mm. It was just too much. Whereas this way, you, you can't in a funny way you can't even keep your nerves up for that long. Finally, just go oh the <laughs> hell with it. Let them come, you know. You, you, because it is spread out, you just say I'm doing what I do, and you know. It's like what? the law of averages in a way. <laughs> yeah. It's like being an athlete, you know, you can't hit a home run every single time. So mm. it's like, okay, I'm going to strike out. Tonight. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, mean, you have it, to learn I find it more, re more relaxing. You, you find it different. I think what? the concentration is greater if you know they're all there. Oh, yeah. Mm. That's what a, a, a lot of it's about, concentration and stamina mm -hmm. and truth. 
look at each other and tell the truth. Yeah. How do you go about forming a character, for instance, when you play Father Flynn? Uh, you use many hand gestures that seem specific to that person. You've yeah, well, body language. How did you come up no, with that? You know, I, I, you know, every character is different. Obviously, but Father Flynn, uh, with this incident, his, his, because we're all dressed in black, black most of the time, mm. the hands become something that's very apparent. Uh -huh. And also, the notion of any type of touch or any movement is what one whole part of the play is about. So I was very conscious in that his hands must always be kind of available. They could reach out, they could touch, that they're in play all, all the, time. the time. They could be used as, they, they become this viewed as something that happens on the side that can move around, that could be viewed in different ways. So I consciously keep my hands like this a lot of the time because they're the things that perhaps got them in trouble, perhaps didn't, they're the center of this whole thing. And like, you know, magicians sometimes mm -hmm. go, okay, they wear the gloves, you know, you have to wash the hands even though this is going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was a conscious decision with the hands. Can, can I ask you something? Did yeah. you come to that um, in rehearsal? Do you remember the moment or the, the process where you got? No, I was just very aware of it. From the first day of rehearsal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you made that decision in a sense before yeah, the first before, day of rehearsal? Yeah, before, yeah. And the body, the way he stands? Well, that's more kind of, kind of, uh, I, I wanted him to be, the difficult thing is if, uh, um, this is difficult. Well, well, I, I'm very lucky that I, I kind of work a lot on new writing, is the thing that I'm really passionate about and that I love, perhaps out of fear because I don't want to be compared to people playing other things. I have no knowledge of it myself. I'm not steeped in a history of theatre. I have no idea about the whole thing. I think of local people a lot of the time. I go, well, who the hell would do this? Or what sort of person is this whole thing? So I, I, I was very conscious that this man he walks out very first of all as a priest and if anyone didn't know anything about this play in the very beginning, if you were describing it as a nun who believes a priest well, before you even finish that sentence, most people go, he's guilty. <laughs> so, how do you, so how do I come across this guy? How does this guy physically appear to this whole thing? So I worked, to help, my, my posture is so bad here, I worked a lot of having an openness in this thing here to say that you don't fear, I'm not, I'm not to be feared in any way. So there is a complete openness within his physicality that he doesn't, and at certain times he does, like things close off and all those sort of things where he goes down. But I had to work a lot and I consciously just decide and just expand everything out. And then because he's from the Bronx and all that, there was a little bit of kind of swagger in the whole thing as well. <laughs> so all of a sudden it becomes this whole different thing. And then you're dealing with somebody who's able to do these things. Anyway, so I thought of him physically. Because you have yeah. that long monologue. You start off with the you know, a yeah, long yeah, monologue that you have to do. Yeah. As the days rolled on, and he wasted away with fevers, thirst, and starvation, he began to have doubts. Had he set his course right? Was he still going on towards his home? Or was he horribly lost and doomed to a terrible death? No way to know. The message of the constellations, had he imagined it because of his desperate circumstance? Or had he seen truth once and now had to hold on to it without further reassurance? That was his dilemma. On a voyage without apparent end. There are those of you in church today who know exactly the crisis of faith I describe, I want to say to you, doubt can be a bond as powerful and sustaining as certainty. When you are lost, you are not alone. How is that to begin a play with a monologue? Well, you know, the last two shows I've done, I've had to look at audiences in the eye, mm -hmm. and I 
I'm comfortable now because it's, it's been two years of looking at people in the eye, but it's 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 kind of horrendous. It's hard. I have to do it too. Do you? I mean, well, the amount of people who sleep, the amount of people who <laughs> also themselves. Oh, you mean the audience is sleeping? Yeah. No. Sometimes. Not yes. in doubt. Are you kidding me? Oh, oh yes. Oh, I oh yes. No, I'm very expensive nap. Oh, how horrible! You can see right them now. sleeping. They're all sleeping. Wake up! Wake up. No. <laughs> and they oh. put the sleepers in the front row. <laughs> it's the best it's place terrible. to go now. Always. You know, the thing that I find hard about it is that some, in some scenes, I'm directly addressing the audience. Yeah. And, the, and it's sort of almost class, in, like in classical plays where um, you're directly uh, addressing Absolutely one person. All right, yeah. You're right. right? And, but you can put that person changes seating. It's like, that if you're, let's say I'm addressing my yeah. grandson, if I had one, <laughs> here and then there and then there and then there. Did you there. say undressing? <laughs> dressing. That's your play. That's your other play. play. I'm glad you asked me to come in. Yeah, there's no doubt. Fun, <laughs> yeah. But addressing. I would say addressing. Anyway, uh, you know that that person's got to move in different seats so that everyone, especially at the Vivian Beaumont, where the audience is on three oh. sides. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of it's tricky. So that, that, that direct address turns into almost, I feel like a lazy Susan, you know, you're just like passing the salt, you know, I have to keep, I keep, I keep passing my salt as I go around, you know, turning in a little circle. But then there are some scenes that are very private where the fourth wall is definitely in. So, but I'm very aware because I, as I've already picked out my favorite people that I'm speaking to mm. throughout the show. And then all of a sudden in some of these private scenes, they must go away in an instant, oh. they must vanish. And yet I'm very aware that I've already made my contact with them and somehow um, I now have to be, make them go away and just be very oh, private I again. I love that. I mean, I, I've had to look, at, because I have to look and I try and get a smile, like the very first thing you just go and the guy smiles. And once they smile, you've got them straight away, boom. You can't, you know, they, I don't mean to address audiences they, but I mean, we <laughs> yeah. all know what we're talking about, like that, that audience. But I... I don't want to do it anymore. Look at it. I actually had a, the funniest one for me was where I, if I, you can see sometimes people just starting to nod and I go, I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm going to grab you. I'm going to really try and, you know, wake mm -hmm. you up in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. On two separate occasions where I'm playing, I go, I'm going to help you out here, buddy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to miss. I, and I'm playing a scene to them and as I'm <laughs> looking right in the eye, they fall asleep. <laughs> Yeah. That's terrible. I, I've had the opposite experience. In, well, when I was doing Hedwig, I, we, I'm, that's, a hard, that's a hard show to speak to. But the 11 o'clock Friday night shows, oh, yes, you know, it was a little chemically induced. <laughs> stuff. And, and I would, in that show, I had the freedom to do anything and, and took full advantage of it. So I would go to the bar and get them a Coke and bring it back oh. to their seats. Oh. And they would wake oh, up to so this vision. Right. <laughs> so in Sweeney last week, I, uh, I usually I'll find one person for an epiphany when I'm offering somebody in, a, in the audience a shave, complimentary shave. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and this poor guy that I chose was dead asleep, and, oh, no. and his wife nudged him so, once she realized that I was playing the thing to him. Oh, so the guy woke up to me glowering at him from like four <laughs> rows away in full spitting mm. mode, and oh. he's probably still recovering. <laughs> like such a gentle person, and yet on stage... Well, I, I you, work it all out. You, it, I mean, you are terrifying. A partially the makeup, partially the posture. To how did you come to this? Um, how did you come to this? <laughs> how did you come to this? <laughs> to be a maniac. <laughs> um, well, it's. I just went to the story. I just went to the the facts that you're presented with. That what has happened to this this guy and. That was the wonderful thing about working with our director, John Doyle, who, who really just wants you to tell the story and anything that gets in the way, whether it's your ego or your intelligence or your, your ideas of, of the character or anything, or his own ideas or images or things he likes to see, he's really brutal with himself and it encourages you then to just totally get yourself out of the process and just tell the story and it's remarkable. You, you always can see it in other people. You can see when someone else is just telling you the facts and just telling you the story. It's, it's why people stand and watch construction sites, because it's people doing stuff, and it's just interesting. And so 
You bring up. <laughs> I never really understood why people like to construct sites. Well, I, 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 I understand the point. Uh, like but I'm always is, amazed. No, when you I bring see a particular fierceness it. to it. I can well, do that for hours. I mean, I think that's see, I think fiercer than in thing. other productions. <laughs> is well, that not? Uh, maybe or maybe, I, maybe I'm just more pissed off than other yeah, people. Yeah, well, no, I mean, you bring well, a no, but it, to it. it. Well, there's a, there is a, I think maybe it's, it's a part of the times, <coughs> my understanding and, and our production's understanding of what, what the story is trying to tell us about revenge and, and uh, mm -hmm. a sense of, of justice gone awry. Um, uh, and in an odd way, the simpler it is, and the less distance, the, the less, the, my goal was to have people be able to recognize themselves in Sweeney, to be able to recognize that, that need for vengeance, and, and to not feel like he's this overblown character that they could never understand or never, I mean, it's a similar thing to, John Wilkes Booth and Assassins. Yes, uh, I think so the most. It's, it's odd that you would. <laughs> I'm have starting those to special. <laughs> Breen and I are getting, you know, getting into these like, weird people. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's, that's the thing that's really interesting to me is, is having you uh, helping an audience to feel some empathy and, and connection mm -hmm. with people that they couldn't imagine that they could have anything mm -hmm. in common with and then be shocked by their, re their self-realization that, that actually they know that person in themselves too, and they presumably are not gonna go out and commit the same kind of acts, but, and that's, I think, in any kind of character that you're playing, that's an ideal sort of thing to achieve, to, to help people understand something outside of their own shell. And Jill, mm -hmm. do you try to find characters that you relate to that are somewhat like you are? Look what I found. I know. The picture of the naked girl on the Appian Way. No. This is the other picture. The... Oh. The one we took when we got back. In emulation. You were so beautiful. I was. Only, it wasn't the Appian Way. No. It was the Catskills. <laughs> Same obnoxious busload of tourists, though. True. <laughs> True. You know, as, as I played it, I, I f you find things in yourself that, let's say, are the more submerged things in yourself that, that aren't your daily fare. Um, and, and then during rehearsal, they, they grow, and then something else takes over, and that's a character, but it's still grounded in these feelings that you have. Um, I, you know, I, don't, I, I try not to think, well, this is like me or this isn't like me, because, I mean, if something is just, if I don't relate to it and understand it, then you, that, then you just can't do it. But I don't ask myself that question, is it like me or not like me? I, I try to say, or is it- a version it, of me. Is I mean, it, sometimes is some it, actors play a version of themselves, don't they? Yes. In parts. Yeah. <laughs> but but I when think... you know. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, Ma I, Maureen Stapleton is one of the great actresses and the funniest woman I've ever known. And she said when an audience said, penned her down to talk about acting, which she avoids, she finally said, well, you read the play a couple of times, you find out where your character fits in the plot, and you play what you are at that time in your life. <laughs> and she plays Maureen better than anybody. Mm. They play the same. It's strange. <clears throat> Last year I did Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Mm -hmm. Now, I, it never occurred to me ever that I would want to or be asked to play Big Daddy mm -hmm. at 5'8 and uh, <laughs> not terribly large. And it was one of the best, most successful things I've ever done. I had a great time. I got, I understand, I don't read them, but I understand I got terrific reviews. <laughs> and it was a wonderful experience. How about Seascape? You've got all that sand, that hill of sand that you're working on now. I forgot, yes. Yeah. <coughs> See, this in hill, case is, you didn't this know, hill is... Set on a beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, actually, it's... A man the, in crisis. The ascent of K2. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's hardly a beach. It's more like a mountain. Do a mountain <laughs> of sand. 
Well, and not in the how south. is it working on Physically, a pile, it's pile tough. of sand? It's tough on old people to climb around climb. in the sand. <laughs> <laughs> You're told. And, and you know, you work your tail off for two hours and the lizards get the bravos. <laughs> <laughs> the play. <laughs> they're wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful. And Great their costumes, movement is, yes. is astoundingly lizard-like. And, uh, but of course, the play centers on you, on the man. It's well, your um, on crisis. The, the, the older couple, yes. yes. She's trying to keep him alive, and he's saying, just, let's just sit down. You know, we've worked all our lives. Let's just sit, and she won't let him sit down. And then these two green things come into their <laughs> lives. And it's, it's a challenge, but it's very tiring for old people. <laughs> what would you like to do? Move from one sand strip to another. Live by the sea from now on. Well, we have nothing holding us except together. Chattel. Does chattel mean what I think it does? We have nothing we need have. We could do it. And I would so like to. All right. Now you're humoring me. <laughs> It is something I want, though. Maybe only the principal. I suppose our children would have us put away if we announced it as a plan. <laughs> Beach combing, leaf huts. Even if we did it in hotels, they'd have a case for our reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, let's merely do it for today or tomorrow. Who knows? Continue the temporary and it becomes forever. All right. Have things changed a lot on the, in the theater? I mean, uh, working in the theater. Well, this is my 50th year so anniversary on uh, Broadway. Oh, is it really? Yes. Oh, congratulations. And they have changed a lot. They've changed a lot. Yes. Not only do we have a lot of opening nights, uh, I remember that the stage manager used to run the show in dinner jacket on opening night. Oh, gosh. And the last, one of the last plays I was in, I, I would come out and I would see all this white in the front row. And it was little girls with shorts and these little white legs. Oh. And I thought, th this is not a ball game, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I get a little uh, shocked at the, at the, the, costumes that people wear to the theater and to the opera. <laughs> and opening night coming in in, in sweatshirts and uh, it, uh, it somehow takes the, mm. what used to be a uh, Broadway opening night was, uh, was something special and now it's like going to the movies and I, I, I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. The so Theater right. Hall of Fame is going back this year to black tie installation. Now, they, for the last five, six years, they've been doing it in the afternoon. Like, you come in from the office and they give you your prize, you know? <laughs> but this year, they're going back to the, to the way it started out, which was a very elegant ceremony, and uh, it meant something. Maybe the cycle is coming around again. Maybe so. On that note, we're going to take a short break to hear a little bit about the American Theater Wing. The American Theatre Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. We stand for excellence and we support education in the theatre. Best known for creating the Tony Award, our work reaches beyond Broadway and New York. These seminar programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are an unequal forum for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth interviews are heard on XM Satellite Radio. Our grant and scholarship programs support New York theater companies and theater students. And since we began, we have given away more than two and a half million dollars. Our theater intern group helps young people who are just starting in their careers build a professional network. And Springboard NYC is a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country. All of the American Theatre Wing's educational and media programs are available for free, on demand, from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Now, let's return to the seminar. Well, we got you all to the theatre. We got you into the theatre, how you did your parts. Now I'd like to know how being in the theatre affects your life. 
<laughs> well, you do the play, and then, then you sit down and you go to sleep. <laughs> if you sit down in the daytime, you just go to sleep. That's because of this play, because it's so strenuous. But I, how does it affect your life? How does it affect your life? your life? Well, I'm also a mom. I have an 11-year-old, and I'm, I'm a single mom, so... Um, I, it, I don't have, I, he's not at my house every single night, but he's there a good bit of the time. And um, if I'm not, if he's not actually in my residence, I'm speaking to him or calling after him or trying to get his Christmas pageant costume ready or dropping off the lunch, you know, or doing, it's, it's, it's that, just being a mother is a full-time job in itself. And um, so having two full-time jobs is, has always been a juggling act, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, I find that one enhances the other. I think after I became a mother, I became a much more open and, and creative and spontaneous actor because, you know, I didn't, I didn't, have, I didn't have hours to sit around and, you know, <laughs> bathe and prepare and, well, and, also you've and got sleep. <laughs> there's, no, there's no time to sleep. I mean, the right. first few shows after he was born, I, I mean, people were constantly coming up on stage and saying, you have baby vomit on your lapel. <laughs> <laughs> you have granola on your cheek. <laughs> you know, I just like all, constantly cover with all kinds of peanut butter all the time, all the time. And, I, you know, uh, they're, they're, the thing about, for me in the theater is being able to just respond, you know, moment to moment, and that has helped me tremendously. Um, but it is, it's, it's, well, it's what very about you relationships. Also, you also have the best acting teacher in the world living with you when you have a kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. That's true. That's true. I mean, they, they know all the stuff that we spend the rest of our lives trying to learn yeah. again. Relearn. Yeah. And you go back and you have the opportunity to become free of the burdens of adulthood and responsible living and so forth. And so all those things that I hadn't done before, um, I, I used to call my mother when um, certain things would happen and th the memory that I'd long forgotten would come flashing back the first time my son swam to me uh, by himself. I suddenly was reminded of the first time I swam to my mother mm. and uh, the first time I went swinging with him then I remembered swinging. So all these, these, these memories as he gets older are coming back and um, able to well, share One of the reasons I ask this question is I've tried a couple of times to have friendships with people in the theater. No. <laughs> <laughs> You see? So nobody they have warned to you? be stalwart and loyal. <laughs> they have to you, stay up late. <laughs> you can't, they are never available for the birthday party, the visit, the lunch, the Christmas, the New Year's, your illness. Mm -hmm. you, it, how do you maintain relationships with people? Well, I think they, they really have to, they have to understand. I mean, it has to be a, a kind of a spoken understanding in some cases, especially if it's not mm -hmm. someone who's in the theater. And movies have a different set of, of issues where you're just sort of <laughs> gone mm. out of the illness, the birthday, the big <laughs> drama, whatever's going on. Okay, I'll be back in three months to <laughs> re retie that knot. But you know, you think you have, oh, I have a lot of time. I only am at the theater for two hours, for God's sake, and add an hour, whatever. I'm going to be able to just continue my life. It just is so not the way <laughs> it is, because those are the most important hours <laughs> for friends, those, those dinner-ish hours. And also, someone said, and I think it's quite true, you wake up in the morning and it's half hour. Because yeah. your whole day is going, going toward that performance yeah, at night. Yeah, and the, the, the one time that half hour isn't on your neck is after the show, yeah. which is to me, a, really to have a glass of wine mm -hmm. and a meal after the show is an incredible luxury because of what you're saying, that the, the half hour isn't on your neck. And if you have friends who stay up late, you can, <laughs> that works out. <laughs> and, then, and then how much more boring is it when you're doing a musical and you wake yeah. up in the morning oh, and, or God, in the middle of the night vocalize. and just, and check to see if your voice is still there. <laughs> 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 Of course it's not, you know, at like five in the morning. But oh. <laughs> it's just, I, it gets well, so tedious. Well, this is where coming from Texas comes in handy. I have a theory about uh, actors who come from Southwest or any big open areas because we're used to just crawling out of bed and screaming across the house or right. sc screaming across the farm or screaming across the backyard. And just, we just, we come loud down there. <laughs> <laughs> we just come, we're just louder as a species. <laughs> so, you know, that's, you know, that's hel always helpful, I think. <laughs> I, we, we were talking about this earlier, though, just trying to live a life, and especially relationships around around an acting schedule. It's just I certainly haven't mastered it at all, and and I struggle with it a lot because I 
you know, people and family and relationships are really important to me, and I, I never made a conscious decision to sacrifice that going into this. And I so admire people. Paul Newman seems to me, uh, he's not someone I know at all, but just as an outside observer, he seems to be someone who has managed to really get it right. And you know, and, there's a funny you know, you thing, meet people I like that from time to time, and it that, gives you that hope. I notice, you know, if, if, since it's the American theater wing, and, and with theater, because so much, and particularly not, not musicals, theater happens off Broadway, the wages are so small. Mm. I mean, last year when I was doing Frozen, I was taking home $250 a week. For a, a, and it was a hit show. Yeah. You know, moved to Broadway, it was a big thing. So you look around, you're doing seven, eight shows a week. You're doing, you're doing that whole, th the whole thing. There isn't a lot of money. As I g get older, I start to notice that the people around me, and this is kind of the, the unspoken thing, are not in relationships. Mm. Mm. They don't have, you know, houses. If it's theater. Now, obviously, if you go, go to the West Coast and make some money in TV and get all that sort of thing. But the people who just stay in theater, it's... I don't want to say it's sad because there's a glam it's very glamorous and we get to live our lives vicariously through mm -hmm. the amazing people we meet. Mm -hmm. We get taken around to all these incredible things. But there's a lot of people we tend to have, it tends to be an incestuous business. <laughs> and quite rightly because they're the people who kind of understand this. You know, I sometimes get embarrassed if I have some friend call me up before. You know, I'd like to, and it's different for you, you're up with your kid, but like 10.30, I'm not out of bed. And they're like, going, you're not up yet? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm out of bed. I'm, like, no, I'm, not, I'm not anywhere near out of bed. <laughs> and, and those are the things because I want my main energy is going to be at night time. I'm going to be going like this. But there's a, there tends to be, not to make it, there's no, nothing mar being a martyr about this no, or anything like that. But it tends to be this, you know, if it, you go through your 20s believing that anything can happen and you're going to get paid and it doesn't matter. And then you're slightly into your 30s and relationships go, wow, this is a good play. <laughs> Maybe I go and do this play. It's a great part. It'll mm. allow me to do this other thing. And then you reach a stage where you're going, it's not allowing you to do anything. This is our lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, but it, it tends to... Uh, so you have to give up something to be a stage actor. I don't think... It's a sacrifice? Now you're, well, I wouldn't call it a sacrifice because I do it willingly and the rewards are so... Well, I don't, I'm not suggesting it would outweigh a child. I don't have a child at all, you know, I mean, I, you know and I hope to. But the, um, I, think, I think you kind of do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I stopped, yeah. I stopped doing theater for about 20 years. Yeah, I haven't well, seen you. Because I, I was not capable of balancing what I could do. I, I just couldn't have children. Because you were always away, especially when they get to be school age, you're, le you're really getting ready like w when they're walking in the door, and then you're gone when they're, doing, when they're home at night, and then you miss taking them to school. And I, I just, it, it, I, co I couldn't do, and also, you see, you have a wonderful, that's a very positive way to look at the, the way one thing gives the other thing. I just felt, oh my God, I'm, as an actor, you're very self-involved. Mm -hmm. you, you have to be. You have to be thinking about these things, and your imagination is going the whole time about this person. And as a mother, you're, you're completely giving and, com and, and, and involved in someone else's soccer and ballet. And I, I just felt so discombobulated that I just thought, I, I can't do this. I have friends who take turns. I mean, she'll work. Oh, there you go. And then she, then he's, it's his turn, you know. And uh -huh. she'll well, stay both home. Both in the business, George. Yes. Yeah, both. Both actors. Well, my hu my husband's in the business. Yeah. You know, so you and I have been married for who's... for thirty years, but I don't know. Well, I it's just, just I couldn't decision. leave the children. I could, that was me. I couldn't leave the children. For me, it was more like um, <coughs> I wanted my son to see me do what I do. Mm -hmm. That's so great. And as as it's developing, in fact, like no one, I mean, my whole career started to get kind of moving after he was born. And I was like, I just gave birth. I'm breastfeeding. It's sort of impossible at the moment. <laughs> Not and, a good time. And it, yeah. And so, it, it, but in a way, he was sort of like a good luck charm. Like he showed up and, and it, yeah, there isn't a lot of sleep, but I've sort of said, like, this is my life and this is how we're all going to make this work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's interesting because I think it's an individual decision. I think in anything, you can make anything work as long as the child knows that 
he or she is loved, and um, it's, it's sort of like we're going to on this journey together. And it's been very exciting, and he's a part of it. And it, talk about being born in a trunk. I mean, this kid has gone everywhere and seen mm. everything and met everybody. And his family is large because of it. You know, it's not just his blood family. And this is what is such a privilege about being a New York actor is mm -hmm. that our community is so big mm. and it's so loving. And it's, it's, you know, it gave me such joy to go to the Broadway flea market this fall um, and just to see We've all like watched each other grow up. We know our kids. We know our parents. We've watched some of our parents die. We've watched you know people get married and divorced and married again. And it's just, it's unlike any other thing that I, you know, it's a it's a large loving community and it's a generous community. And I feel so and there privileged. There are a couple of here. rotten cousins in it too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes I read a quote from Sean O'Casey that said, the theater is not for someone what bleed easy. <laughs> well, and yet that's all you're so called upon to do is bleed <laughs> is easy, bleed really. Easy, right? that's, that's, for me, one of the, the two most difficult things I've found since leaving school and really trying to make a living doing this were, one, discovering that, especially in the early days, most of your time working at your craft was spent trying to enable yourself to work at your craft, you know, finding an agent, finding a way to eat while you've tried, tried to find a job to actually do the acting that you meant to do in the first place. And that was really frustrating to discover when I left school. And then the rest of it has been trying to figure out how to have a life and a career and, and have them feed each other, like, like Vicky but you have to. a second career. You're a rock and roller, a guitarist. Oh, it's, uh, it's, played it's, with Sonic Youth or something. I, I played with Bob Mould, who, yeah, and, and I, have, I have a guy from so Sonic you, Youth play on my record. So for you, stuff, it wasn't so bad when they said you're going to have to play an instrument in no, this production of that, Sweeney Todd because you are so a professional guitarist. Well, but professional implies that you make money doing it. Oh, okay. I <laughs> 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 lose guitarist. money playing music. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would well, spoil my indie credibility if it was. You know, if I made any money doing it. Um, well, but that's interesting because I, I had always played guitar and always had bands from the time I was in junior high school. And we were terrible, but we were loud, so that was the important thing anyway. Um, and it wasn't until I started, until I did this tour with, Bob Mould was, had a band called Husker Du and a band called Sugar, and they were very influential. Like the, Much of modern American indie and punk music sort of, originates from, from Bob's bands, and, and he was a hero of mine, so I was really excited to get the chance to just be a guitar player and tour the country and tour uh, the UK just being a musician, and that sort of gave me the, um, the chutzpah, I guess, to finish songs and actually write songs myself, and having that creative output that I had control over, whether it was going to be listened to by three people who were friends of mine or, or more, it didn't matter. I finally had a creative outlet, so I wasn't just stuck waiting for the next job, acting job, mm -hmm. to be able to be creative and to feel like I was doing things. And that made me relax so much more about my career. It made me able to turn down things that, I've never, I've never had a very extravagant lifestyle, so it doesn't take me a lot of money to survive, and it was easy to scrape together enough just to eat and pay rent. Um, but I didn't feel like I had to take jobs that I wasn't excited by because I was getting creative fulfillment by writing and by, by creating, even if it was for nobody. Uh, and I think in a way that that's probably when things started looking up career-wise because I'd, I would go into auditions and it's like, well, if I don't get this, I mean, I would love to get it, but if not, I'll just go home and play guitar and <laughs> that'll be really fine. So I think finding that creative outlet was really important for me, so I didn't just depend on music all the time. But, um, mm. but, but I was going to say earlier, too, when we were talking about relationships and things, it dawned on me that we actually, I, I do have relationships, it's, but it's a relationship often with the piece you're working on or the character you're working on or, or 
there's certainly you have the relationship with the company that you're working with and the other actors. That's probably that you work unique with. in that that actors tend to whom the first day of rehearsals everyone loves each other from the moment mm -hmm. they meet yeah. each Instant other, family. and then it kind of They're falls apart to different points <laughs> on the way. But <laughs> most, Just like most, a real family. I think most of the jobs, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. most of the jobs will be reticent meeting people and then yeah. grow to love them. Yeah. Actors tend to do the opposite. <laughs> love first. <laughs> All in yeah. love and then just goes <laughs> horribly wrong. <laughs> oh. I had a question for everybody since I'm surrounded by distinguished colleagues. How do you all replenish your spirit after, uh, after you're on output? Hmm. How do you, what do you do to fill the well back up when you're in the middle of a run? I that, have a house in the woods, in the country, it's not the woods, that I bought. 1967, whatever that mm. is, a long time ago. And I bought it for therapy so that I have somewhere to go and work on it and uh, mm. to get away from the play I was in. And it still does that for me. And I don't work in the spring because that's planting season. Oh. <laughs> oh, wow. I stay oh, up You there literally plant. I get, <laughs> I get that. That's the most important thing. And do you go up on your days off? Will you go up Sunday night? I'll go up Sunday night. And then come back Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody I, else? I go to movies and, okay. and plays and, and concerts for me. Music is, has always been a fundamentally nourishing thing in all kinds of music. And, but I, I feel that need often, especially in a run. Just I want to see, it doesn't have to be anything like what I'm in, but I just want something that, that will make me excited about creating and acting or I love going to see there's nothing better than going to see someone else in a play or a production of a play and just be so thrilled and intimidated and and awed and excited and challenged by it and think oh god there's so much better than I'm ever going to be but <laughs> tomorrow night tomorrow night I'll 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 try to make myself closer to them so you do go and see each other when we can. Well, it's hard. Sometimes I'm too Schedules tired. Yes, yeah, hard. Or if it's my only night off with my son, I usually yeah, I just laugh that I can't do. Yeah. Sometimes, I used sometimes to, Wheel yeah. of Fortune and spaghetti. That's my. <laughs> I, you know, you can rent a movie. Baseball. Yeah, Renting right. a movie is a good one. Yeah. I go, ba uh, go baseball. Go to baseball game? Baseball. 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 As an Irish. No, I watch it. Hmm. I watch it obsessively on Mondays. I go. I travel. This year, I managed to go to Chicago and Boston on my Mondays yeah. and go watch. Oh go to baseball. That's baseball not an fan. Irish sport. That. Do they have oh, baseball? I fell in love with it. Yeah, I'm, obs I'm slightly. So obsessed. So what, what do you do like now during the off season? Are you just bereft until? We're oh, just bored. Is what we are. I'll be on <laughs> the internet checking out the trades, the Mets. No. Okay. Do you do like fantasy? <laughs> I go. There, I go to the. Uh, I also. I go. Wow. In between shows on a Saturday <laughs> or a Wednesday, I either go, go to the sports bar. No, I oh. go to the Met or MoMA. Oh. That's what's just what I was going to say. I do. Yeah. It's yeah, just yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I eat and I go and I sit in one room, oh. and it tends to just go. Mm -hmm. Just look at some piece of art and not understand it or do understand <laughs> it. And go back oh, and do the show. Yeah. I remember hearing Blythe Danner once say that she. No matter how tired she is between shows, she'll go outside of the theater just to even take a walk around the block so that she'll be different when she comes back for the second show. She'll have seen something at the hot dog stand or she'll have, you know, something will have changed so she's not the same person. There's the nothing quite as nice, though. This is probably the greatest thing ever to be an actor at work <laughs> in, in New York. You cannot beat a nap. I was a just going to say that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing is as good. A nap between shows. Nothing it, is it, it, <laughs> I'm not saying It's like being a child the again, I think, in some way. <laughs> Are you all comfortable on the stage, or do you uh, have little rituals and things you have to do before you Depends go on out? The set. It's a set. <laughs> <laughs> it's all that sand. <laughs> <laughs> Chafing. No, I mean, you, are you naturally, were you all naturally comfortable? Standing on a stage, Michael, would it come easy or did you ever have stage fright and I th nerves? Well, and no, I've had, I've had horrible, debilitating stage fright sometimes. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing I hate more than having to be dead or s sleeping or still on stage. Because mm -hmm. I just, as soon as, it's the same, I think it's the same impulse that makes you think you're just going to scream obscenities when you're in church <laughs> or throw yourself off a bridge when you it's just if you if you know you have to lie still and quiet you just somebody's yeah. watching you breathing yeah. yes oh, the blanket is moving have you had to be yeah. dead on stage a lot yeah wow <laughs> okay then 
Um, <laughs> but, I, but I do think that, I think the reason I'm a, an actor is because I f discovered, really in high school, it was the first time it really dawned on me that I felt more at home there than I did in a lot of other, on, on the stage, even just a bare stage with nobody in the audience, more so than I did in a lot of other aspects of my life. And that's including the stage fright and, and everything else, but there was something about uh, being there. And it's, it wasn't about being watched. It wasn't about, um, I felt like I was useful and I was, mm. I was, uh, I had a service to provide there in that location. And, and I, I, I think in, in Letters to a Young Poet, I think Rilke says, if you can think of anything else you can do other than be a poet, even imagine that you might be able to do something else, you should do that because mm -hmm. you, you shouldn't be a poet then. And I sort of feel the same thing about acting. I've never felt like it was a joy. I never felt that I loved it. I felt like it's a, a task I've been assigned and, and I am obligated to do it when I get the chance to do it. And somehow on stage, I felt like that's where I'm whether I like it or not, that's where I'm supposed to be. We can talk to 1,200 people, but if they came back one at a time, yeah. I would be catatonic. I, <laughs> I love it being out there with them mm. as a, a playwright's spokesman to tell the story. Mm. But I'm, I'm shy about meeting people that, that come back one at a time, and some of them are so generous and so giving in their praise and, and wanting to share with you something that they learned today at the show. But it's, it's, it scares me. I made myself do a play where I had to con talk to the audience because I realized I was scared to death of you. Mm. And I just wanted to get over that. And <coughs> I didn't get over it, but I did the play anyway. What I think that's why Anthony Sher has spoken why he did uh, 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 his one-man show, the Primo, that that, mm. that came this year, was he had debilitating stage fright, mm. and he needed to, the best way to do it was do a one-person show that directed it straight to the audience. And he mm. described stage fright in a really wonderful way that I, I hadn't heard it been described before. It's where um, we're all familiar with this, but we, if we're in a run, we can be saying a line and have another voice talk in our head while we're saying I the line. I call them the crows. Then, <laughs> the cr but crows. Anthony Sher calls, uh, called stage fright when he's saying lines, his own voice is say, commenting on what he's saying, and this There's other voice, voice is saying, shut up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it just, then it's just right. become, yeah. oh my God, it's mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. gone. Oh yeah, every night. Had that. You find that every night, George? Every Most night? Every night. Oh, really? Shut up, or why did you do that, or oh, God, yeah, couldn't you have done that God better? God, you're why didn't you stay home tonight? Yeah. The understudy's yeah. oh, so good. Oh, oh. <coughs> I, it, uh, I, most nights, I have that one word, why? <laughs> why am I doing <laughs> this? <laughs> why? It just jumps in, why? Mm -hmm. Gotta be something easier to Well, when it grows from, when you start out, many times we start out saying, look at me, look at me, you know. Uh, then I I if you have any growth at all, you tend to say, look at yourself. I'm trying to show you what you look like when you're having fun, mm -hmm. when you're in mourning, when you're in anger, and hope that you recognize the humanity that we all have, that we all share. It, <laughs> it is a growth, I think, as, as an actor, and if you've been doing it as long as I have, I hope there has been a growth because I, I feel more satisfied. I feel now that if, if the audience doesn't respond, it's not their fault, it's my fault. I'm the stimulus. They're the response. And if they don't respond the way I want them to, it's my fault. I don't, I don't blame the audiences ever anymore. As a kid, you know, I used to say, oh, God, it's a terrible audience. To me. <laughs> it's not a terrible audience. You were terrible. That's what it was. I've learned that now, but it took a long time. What other things have you Well, it's just, I think it's so interesting that you all, I think one of the things that people don't realize is how much you are with the audience, how mm. much that audience is a part of the play in the theater, and it, it's, it's such a huge difference from making movies or anything else. How, how it's such a vibrant, important presence, your communication, their communication back, I mean, it really is part of the play. 
And I think... It was Rosemary Harris used to say, these people, you want to be an actor? These people allow you to be an actor. Yeah. Yeah. You've got yeah. to love them and nurture them and take care them. of them. You have to love them. And you do, ha and you have to sort of learn to... I, for me, I had to learn to love the audience. Mm. I had a very, you know, okay, but I'm doing this. Yeah. <laughs> this is how I see things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and now I have a, I, I hope I have a more generous uh, spirit and I, want to, I really want to embrace the audience. I want to include them in, in what I'm thinking and, and creating. What about seducing the audience? I've heard... I'm too old for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're not so natural. Oh, no, you're not, Metaphorically <laughs> speaking. I know it. Not, you not, a bit. not the way you were behaving in the green room. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Father Flynn again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've heard actors or read that that's part of the technique that people have to love you. You have to project something that they can love back. But really, mm. if no. you just if I go reveal it. yourself, yeah. I think, mm -hmm. that's people are drawn to, to honesty and sincerity and, and, and the, the less you, the more you can make yourself vulnerable, the more, even in the most... Uh, invulnerable character, but the more you can reveal the fragility and the humanity of the the character, the more the audience will come to you. That's the other mistake I constantly mm. make is trying to go get the audience or convince them or something. And the trick is always to just let them come, and and that's about being open and available and not imposing your will. It's all it's all so spiritual and psychological and it's not surprising with the roots of drama being in religion and ancient Greece and um, and it's it's uh, and that idea of service and providing a service to the community in in that reflection is is I couldn't agree more with I think I that's think changed I think that has changed though and I think it is you know We've reached a stage, particularly on Broadway now, where th tickets are ninety dollars each. Mm. People, now there are obviously there's always ways to get cheaper tickets, no matter what. There's always ways to get cheaper tickets, but th it's an expensive night out. They're going to go to have a meal. If they're playing for babysitters, parking, mm -hmm. anything like that, you're running into a couple, you know, several hundreds of dollars for a night out, and theatre and through our whole the whole marketing thing that comes with our business now we're marketed as entertainment. Mm. And entertainment churches that run on entertainment value or anything like that that uh, try to attain towards any sense of what you both speak about in a spiritual sense um, is not going to feed anything That's because right. the bottom line is pick up the posters on the way out, pick up the jack, pick up whatever you, we can sell you so more things. But I, I'm glad that I don't think we have a lot of dialogue between audiences, actors and everybody going, really why are we doing this whole thing? Like is there something that we need that we're trying to go, we're all going to sit in and pretend and hopefully be, g gain some enlightenment at the end of something, provoke some discussion and the being provoked is entertaining in itself. It, 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 the entertainment does not mean that you sit back and you are, everything that you believe is, you're told you're right to believe this. Mm -hmm. And to sit back and go, you don't, you're not challenged in any way. But because theatre is such a big business and it is huge, you know, the money we're talking about is so huge now, it's, everyone's trying to find the package. Mm. But you I know, how do you, you ca it's so difficult to say we're going to have a play and guess what, two people are going to be lizards. Right. <laughs> now, of course, we all know that it's hugely <laughs> yes, entertaining and, and, you know, entertaining in that sense. Right. But it's, provo it's provocative and all those other things. But, it's but I see signs of life. I, I absolutely agree with you, but I see signs for hope more recently, I feel, than I have for a long time. And it may be the result of the climate that we're in, the times we're in, that people are finally starting to realize there is uh, more of a need for that. But I feel a place I, like yours and Well, Light and in the Piazza the certainly, I mean, yours. this is like, we thought this was going to close June 12th. I mean, it was supposed to close. And it has, the center, the message is very simple. Love, you can, love, let go, love, let go of your burden, release your burden, release your guilt, 
and and allow allow love into your heart and allow love into the people that are around you and it's very simple and we thought oh you know if we believed in it but we weren't sure if people would actually want to come and see it and it's actually I'm eager for you to see it because I, I would be interested to hear what you what you think about the movement of of, of artists you know Craig Lucas and Adam Gettle and Bard Shear saying yeah, this is the story we're telling these are the people that we want to interpret the, our words and our thoughts and you know, people, people, it seems to be changing. I mean, it's... But in ways to change, George, over your whole time, over like, over an extended time, over 50 years, has theater gone in cycles? Or is it a cyclical thing or is there a constant or am I just somebody like who's, who's just arrived and has these little ideas and you're sitting back <laughs> no. going, you know, like... Uh, you Most know, of the things that I did in the early years would be done off-Broadway now. Okay, right, yeah. Because they were uh, um, entertainment. A light entertainment, and and they didn't. Well, I don't know that off Broadway is the, is the right place for it. I'm, I'm just saying they were not a, a monumental idea plays. You know what right. I mean? They were entertainment. The idea that Broadway was where you went for serious mm -hmm. idea plays. It was. was it was when I when I started changed. out. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. it got that's quite frivolous. <laughs> but I'd say it's the opposite now. Yeah. Seems as if it's the opposite. I mean, you know, one thing I have to say. Uh, there have been X number of new plays this season, most of which have gotten bad review from the New York Times. And I think that, and that hasn't changed, living under the, the despotism of the New York Times. And I think that is difficult for, for plays. I think uh, the financial atmosphere is <coughs> difficult, and I think the critical atmosphere is confining you know, in, 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 in other places they have three critics, let's say, who have a, a weight. And in film, there really isn't a critic. Or there's one or two. But compared to like, you know, most of the plays, the new plays that come over now, a lot of plays are coming over from Britain and Ireland. Thankfully for me, like I'm, this is great for me. <laughs> but, but like, you know, there's, a, there's, if you're a young writer in this country, I mean, in Ireland, it's an interesting thing, in tax laws in Ireland, artists live tax free in Ireland. They live wow. tax free, writers live tax free. Yeah. Wow, actors amazing. don't. <laughs> no. Actors, because the tax laws state actors as being interpreters. Uh -huh. Oh, and in fact, we are we're much more parasitical than the other than the other and the other mediums. We don't create it. We do need our own. So it if my pool is writers, and that, like that's the whole thing, new writers. How if a new writer comes up, and first of all, he or she is going to have to go through so many workshops, all these things to perhaps over a period of five years maybe get a play on in the city, or. Does this person who has an ability decide to go write a TV show on the West Coast and make 20 grand, 50 grand a week? But people are still doing it. There are more plays running now than there were 15 years ago. Are, are there? Yes. New playwrights? You well, think I don't know about new. There's new pl there's plays. Know. There's a and lot I think of action. We you used to have empty houses. But, it's, uh, it's but you look at like the Mr. Marmalade and, 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 and the play down at Lincoln Center by... Third. E when, when oh, you third. I, I was actually thinking of, no, the one down, um, I can't remember, what, Ruby Sunrise, is it called? Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, at uh, the public. Uh, at the public. Yeah. Oh, okay. sorry, sorry. And these people have really probably workshopped it, and they're, they're young, and then it's just like slammed down. Well, I, if I were one of them, I would go to Hollywood and write. Mm. Well, well, I think you can be an actor in this country. You can't necessarily be an actor in New York, but now there mm -hmm. are so many wonderful well, theaters throughout true. the country. Chicago. I was a part of the opening of the Guthrie Theater, uh, 40, I don't know, 1962, whatever that was. I believe the new one is opening this summer, right? The well, it's, it's new, about yeah, in yeah, June, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we opened with Hamlet, and they're closing with Hamlet, mm. this oh, great. building, and then that will be demolished, and, be, mm. you know, they... It, the Walker Art Center gave the land for that, so they've got a new theater complex down on the Mississippi River. But there are wonderful theaters throughout That's the so country. That's so true. That we uh, forget that. And people are still and coming into New York. I mean, actors still arrive here. They're still auditioning. And I don't know that people yeah. just get they off. They they <laughs> right. I mean, you, we keep. How long have they been saying Broadway's dead? I mean, the, for, forever, <laughs> for hundred years. They've been saying it's over. It's over. But and we don't. We don't always value our home grown product though. I mean there's like our, our production of Sweeney, I keep saying, I, I pinch myself daily that 
this is on Broadway because, you know, BAM, sure, downtown, easily, but 10 people playing their own instruments and doing the show with chairs and a ladder, and that's it. <laughs> right. You know, and it would, there's the no way. And the audience is there for and it. The audience is, is so there. So the audience will come. But, but the only reason we're there, I believe, is because it was done in London first, and it came here. If it had been done here first, Honest. it wouldn't have just, like, plopped down in the middle of Broadway. And thank God that it has, but... Um, you know, we don't we we don't value that, especially in the Broadway community. I I. Well, you're right. I I agree with you, but I think I also kind of disagree because those plays have gone through similar processes over in Britain, and you're only seeing the cream of the crop. Right. And so, it really, is the best ones that you're going to get that are coming over here. Most of it is not going to make it over. Like when we send Desperate Housewives over there. <laughs> we don't want to end on a note like this. Let's quickly go around and say, what's the good thing about being an actor? Jill, what, was the, what is the thing that has held you to this profession? Well, you, you get to live lives, li live different lives and create in your imagination. I mean, it, it's very, very fulfilling and wonderful journey. And, and every night... You say, oh, maybe if I tried this. What if I did it this way? The last night of the play I just did, we, you're, still, you're still asking yourself, God, maybe I, you know, something's not right there. What if you say this? You're, you're constantly growing, and if, if, if you're lucky, you know, I mean. Uh, and you all are. Uh, you, mean, you feel yes, this, yes. Sense, we're, we're a, yeah. feel this wonderful sense of tomorrow very... night, yeah. you know, and... Get so to try it again. Get to yeah. try it. Get it right mm -hmm. tomorrow. You can never be fulfilled. <laughs> yeah. Completely. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and you? you and you. And well, you? it keeps me off yes. the streets. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good reason. I, I just, it's, 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 a, it's your own life, and, and you have the right to do with it as you choose. And the theater is, is the most welcoming place that I've been a part of because I'm not very good at anything else. So. <laughs> I'm grateful to be there. Yeah, I'm sure. A refuge mm -hmm. then yes. uh, for you in some ways. Thank you so very much. It was wonderful to talk to you all of you. I appreciate thank thank you. learning yeah. so much about the theater. So I thank everybody here. Uh, we are the American Theater Wing seminar working in the theater. It is from CUNY's Graduate Center in association with CUNY's Department of Continuing Education and Public Programs. They have been our partners for many years and we thank them very much. Thanks.